It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a ple pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be introduced by you, David. Thank you. Thank you for those, for those very kind, kind words. Um, it m might be helpful if I begin by saying um, a little bit more autobiographically so you know sort of um, who I am and where I'm coming from. I am a psychologist by background. I did psychology for half of my first degree. The other half was in philosophy. I trained in clinical psychology and had a, had a stint in the NHS in the first phase of my life. Then I went um, up to Cambridge and worked for the Medical Research Council, and, and uh, we were, we were um, it was in the early days of cognitive therapy, and we were trying to, to put that on a firmer scientific footing than it initially had, and, and to do that looking at some of the, uh, of the cognitive processes associated with disorders of anxiety and, de and depression, mainly attention and memory. And I was, I was joined by some very distinguished colleagues in my time in that MRC unit, uh, Mark Williams, uh, John Teasdale, Andrew Matthews, really names, names to conjure with. Um, towards the end of that time, I got ordained as a priest in the Church of England. I'd always kind of thought that was inevitable since I was, uh, since, uh, I was in my teens. It was more a question of when I was going to do that. And um, I got to the age of, of 40 and... Um, reflecting on life at that midpoint as one does, it seemed kind of absurd to postpone it any longer. And the, the sense I had most clearly was that if I got to the end of my working life and had not become a priest, I would feel I had not done the main thing that I was supposed to do with my life. And with that clear insight, I thought in my 40s was time to get on with it rather than go on postponing it, which is what I've been doing for a very long time. So... Um, um, I was eventually ordained at 44, and by that time, I think I'd had a sense of the inevitability of this step for three quarters of my life. It was an unusually long gestation period before it eventually happened. Having been ordained as a priest in the Church of England, I had a, had a lovely sense of coming home to where I was supposed to be. Um, um, I've never had any regrets about it. And unusually amongst people who have a full-time secular job, I've always chosen to shoulder shoulder the burdens of, of, of um, responsibility for a church myself. Um, it's always been a big drain on my time and energy and stopped me doing some other things, but it's also been a great joy. I, I was, um, at the start of, uh, of um, this year, also made a canon of the Church of England, which was an <coughs> honour I was very pleased to receive. So that's been another, another important strand in my life as well. Um, I run this psych psychology, and re um, psychology and religion research group in Cambridge, and um, I'll say something about that. We do three kinds of things, really. We do, we do scientific work in the psychology of religion. We're particularly interested in religious cognition. That's a point of continuity with my cognition and emotion days in, in the MRC. It seems to us methodologically that a lot of the psychology of religion, too much of the psychology of religion, has been based on questionnaire data. And though questionnaire data has its place, it provides a fairly superficial insight as to what's going on in people's minds. And you need to broaden the database considerably. And there are two ways in which you need to broaden it. I think one is into richer qualitative data. But what we've been particularly trying to do is to broaden it into experimental data as well, using the kind of methodologies that we've been developing in, the, in my MRC days for looking at cognition and emotion and, and applying those to the um, investigation of religious beliefs and, and thoughts. Um, it's, a, it's a complex area and, and we're um, not a lot of other people w working in it at the moment that we hope other people will follow in our footsteps. But we're starting to get some, some interesting findings. So, so for example, um, if you present people with a, a list of, a, of attributes, adjectives that may describe people, and, um, and uh, people or beings they may apply to, like sort of your mother, Superman, God... And, and, and so on. The, the speed with which people say 
Um, yes, a positive attribute applies to God is a pretty good index of their religious commitment. And we're quite pleased to have got that kind of tight experimental index of that sort of down to milliseconds. And uh, we'll be interested now to look at the correlates of that and whether, and whether that actually maps onto other uh, things that might be associated with belief rather better than people's, people's sort of ordinary verbal responses, which are, I guess are massively contaminated by social desirability factors and other stuff like that. So we do that kind of sort of quite hard science in, in psych psychology of religion, trying to put that area onto a more rigorous footing than it usually has been. <coughs> Um, we also do work on the interface of psychology and theology, and that's what I'll mainly be drawing on in this talk, um, work that takes psychology as one discipline, theology as another, and brings them into dialogue to see what they each have to say about various important questions to do with human nature. Um, and we also, also do various kind of applied projects. We've done quite a lot of, uh, of psychology in service of the Christian church, but our, um, our present wave of applied work is more, more concerned with Islam, and we're trying to develop <coughs> educational programs to um, make Muslim youth less vulnerable to radicalization than they are at the moment, trying to improve the, the cultural awareness of imams. We're doing this in collaboration, of course, with some mu Muslim <coughs> colleagues and see, seem, seem to be attracting quite a lot of government and EEC funding for this and I think that's going to be quite an important strand in the work of the research group over the coming years. <coughs> so that's what we do in, in the research group. I have, I have um, various sort of broad and maverick intellectual interests and I might just sort of mention those. Um, one you may not think is so maverick is Jung. Jung has always been important to me. I had, I had four years of psych psychotherapy with um, a Jungian therapist who was also a priest, and that, that consolidated my interest in Jung, though it was, it was there before that. Um, and uh, Jung, I think, interfaces with religious thinking in a far richer way than any other psychologist I, I know and work with. So he's always been very important to me. Um, another um, more maverick influence is Rudolf Steiner, uh, who some of you may have heard of, some, some not, a kind of esoteric um, teacher, um, the dates are 1861 to 1925. Um, he... he he writes all sorts of extraordinary things, and I have, I have, um, I have difficulty sort of sifting what is what is useful in Rudolf Steiner. There are some followers of Rudolf Steiner who can kind of accept it all. I've never been one of those people, and um, I th I find myself the things that Steiner developed himself are more helpful to me than the things that he took over from the Theosophical Society. He was he was for quite a long time. Well, not for a long time, but for a period, general secretary of, uh, of the German section of the Theosophical Society. And I'm not at all sure that that was a helpful stage in his development. And I think, uh, I think what he did on his own after that period is, uh, is richer, deeper, and, more, and of more practical value than what he took over from the the Theosophical Society. Though that was a discrimination that he would never be prepared to make himself, and which his most ardent followers would also not be prepared to make for him. But Steiner's always been, for me, my main sort of route into esoteric wisdom, and my familiarity with him goes back to my sixth form days. So I've been, I've been, I've been traveling with Rudolf Steiner for quite a long time now, and it's been, I think, a significant influence on me to have that, uh, that route into esoteric wisdom. Um, of, the, of the followers of Rudolf Steiner who've been um, most influential with me, I might mention one, Owen Barfield, little known name, um, more name, m m um, more... Uh, m m more of you may know his famous friends. He was one of the Inklings in Oxford in the, in the years after the First World War, along with C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, and Charles Williams. Um, and I think the most philosophically sophisticated of the, of the Inklings 
he had he had quite a, some quite fierce debates with C. S. Lewis, uh, um, uh, who thought that Barfield was wrong-headed about many things, but in the in the end said that. Uh, that um, he'd learnt more from Barfield than Barfield had from him. He said Barfield was the wisest and best of his teachers. And, and uh, in another place, talking about the Inklings, he added, and Barfield towers above us all, which I think is quite a compliment from C.S. Lewis. And uh, um, I, I, I've, I think Owen Barfield is one of the richest and most interesting philosophical voices in 20th century England and uh, someone who's, who's been an important channel for mediating Rudolf Steiner's w- wisdom. Um, if, you want, if you want to go and read, read any Owen Barfield, um, um, he wrote a nice little book, Speaker's Meaning, which is sort of Barfield's introduction to Barfield and, uh, and a, a good place to start. Um, though he described his books once as the, the same old Barfield writing the same old book, but I think, the, I think that's a bit disparaging. So um, um, another, another influence, uh, um, a, um, a contemporary friend is Rupert Sheldrake, who I've known for, known for quite some time. I've, uh, I admire Rupert's work enormously. I find his theoretical, theoretical views very interesting, morphic fields and all that kind of stuff. I think Rupert's a very... Um, very green-fingered experimentalist who has produced uh, more effective data in, in favour of parapsychology than any, anyone else I know. And uh, I think part of what's good about Rupert's approach to that is that he's, he's taken it out of sort of very dry artificial lab experiments where the kind of, of phenomena people are, are investigating are going to be very attenuated and, and conducted experiments that have more ecological validity and I think that's one of the key reasons why Rupert's work has been a lot more successful than the traditional sort of card guessing kind of game in, 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 in parapsychology demonstrating for example that people have a, have a reasonable sense of when they're being stared at even though it's outside their field of vision and as Rupert likes to point out, um, private detectives are trained not to stare at people because people will know they're being stared at and turn around and look at them. So there is some sort of um, um, uh, um, practical awareness of this in the world of, uh, of detective agencies. Then, as I mentioned, I've... Um, I'm a Christian priest in the, in, in, in the Church of England. That's always been an important strand in, in my work. Let me say something about the church I, I, that I run. It's in Edwards. It's an unusual church in the number in the people we have there. A lot of people at St. Edwards are fairly fed up with the church and probably would not be going to any church at all if it wasn't for us. We're about the sort of church of last resort for a lot of... <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I'm, and I'm proud of the fact that, we're, that, that um, our congregation is not just sort of shuffling people around from one church to another, but we are, are a church of last resort, the sort of last safety net before, before people drop out of the church, or sometimes the point of re-entry. We have a lot of New Agers and spiritual seekers in our church, many of whom have a Christian background, gave up on the, on the church for, for various good reasons, because the church that they knew at that time was really just not connecting with their, with their spiritual path and have been very pleased to find in us a church in, in which they feel that the spiritual life is being taken seriously, where there's a, a, um, a broad inquiring spirit and where they can reconnect. And it's been, uh, it's been a very interesting experience as that's built up to see, to see how there can be that kind of rapprochement between um, the Church of England and, and the New Age movement and, and how, how well that goes. So we're a church that, that takes spiritual practice very seriously. We do silence much more than most, uh, most, most church services do. Uh, we're also much, much more open to other, other faiths than most um, Church of England churches are. Um, so that's not a that's not a um, an absolutely new thing. And last Sunday morning we had a we had a service on the theme of being Christian in a multi faith world, and and doing some research for that, I I went back into the work of uh, 
of a 19th century chaplain in the church where I now am, St. Edward's, F.D. Morris, who may, some people think is the greatest 19th century theologian, a remarkably forward-looking, open-minded man. And I, and I hadn't known until I was preparing for the service that back in 1846, F.D. Morris gave, gave a course of lectures on on the religions of the world and their relation to Christianity. Pretty early to be on the multi-faith agenda, I think, 1846. I was quite proud to find that I had a, had a predecessor who was as forward-looking as that. And uh, interesting, the pitch he was taking. I mean, obviously, he was wanting to leave behind the idea that was prevalent in those days and still is in some circles that, that religions apart from Christianity are not worth considering. But um, also, he, were, he, were, he was wanting to stay deeply rooted in his Christian tradition, but, or, but, but still taking uh, uh, um, other religious traditions far more seriously than I think any Christian thinker had done until that time. He wasn't, he wasn't um, wanting to go down the road of saying, well, all religions are basically the same, aren't they? And he sort of cites a lot of ideas like that and then distances himself from them and says that the problem with those ideas is their vagueness, really. And he's wanting to stay much more firmly rooted in his own religious tradition than that. But, um, but, but from that vantage point, taking other religions of the world very seriously to see where there are points of convergence, where there are points of divergence, what there is to be learned from them. It's, it, it's a remarkable book to have come out of the middle of the, uh, of the 19th century, and that says, that something, says something else about the kind of uh, um, open-minded church that I'm involved in running in Cambridge. So there's a focus there on, on, on spirituality, spirituality and personal transformation. And I, go, I guess those are two absolutely key concepts in transpersonal psychology. They're two absolutely central concerns for myself in all my work. And I think they balance each other. There is, on the one hand, spiritual practice, which is something we, we undertake, have a commitment to. And there is, on the other hand, personal transformation, which is, in large measure, I think, the, the result of that, uh, of, of those spiritual practices in our lives and personalities. Important to have that twin emphasis, it seems to me, looking at what people do and looking at how people are changed by it. And probably just instinctive for a psychologist to want to look at both of those things and to understand the connection between them. And the transformation that takes place in people as a result of um, um, spiritual practice, I think, often is, uh, one would hope it would be, um, a whole person transformation. And useful to have some kind of conceptualization then of the different sort of aspects of personality that one would hope would be affected by that. Um, and many people who think about this go back to something like Aristotle's distinction, um, thoughts, feelings, and will, something, something like that. Um, whether it's will or action gets, gets sort of blurred in some versions of this. A version of it came out in the early days of um, behavior therapy for anxiety disorders when, when Peter, Peter Lang... Um, um, proposed a three systems view of fear, fear involving people's um, thoughts and beliefs, involving their feelings and involving their actions. So if you have a, if you have a spider phobic, they, they think that spiders are scary. They, um, they get very frightened when, 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 they, when they see one. They run away from spiders, sort of um, different kind of levels in that. And, and the phys physiological level is important as, a, a, as an index of, of anxiety, though I think anxiety goes beyond that. People have come up with different versions of that kind of uh, threefold system. But it seems to me that if there's going to be any thoroughgoing personal transformation, it needs to run across different aspects of the personality like that. 
I sometimes wonder whether um, transpersonal psychology gets too preoccupied with changes in experience. And uh, uh, I w if that's so, and I mean, I leave it to you to reflect on whether that is, if it's so, I would want to say that beliefs and actions are also very important and uh, equally, in the end, signs of personal transformation. Um, in my MRC days, I was in, involved in le leading a program of research on cognition and emotion. And I... Uh, I'm completely convinced that those two things are very intertwined. We've been through a period in Western culture in which, uh, in which it was widely thought that beliefs and emotions, thoughts and feelings were separate things. I'm sure that that's a mistake. What we think influences our feelings enormously and our feelings influence our beliefs. They're so intertwined that you can't really separate them. <coughs> I think there are some transpersonal circles in which there is an attempt to take the world of experience out of the world of beliefs and to say that experience is what matters and in as far as religious traditions have got into matters of belief, that's just a matter of metaphysics and that's not really where the action is. The action is with experience. That seems to me psychologically, philosophically, a big mistake. Because, I, as I said, I think cognition and emotion, thinking and feeling, are so intertwined that the beliefs people have is going to be deeply intertwined with their experience. So I want to, want to, uh, to put a caution about the, the tendency that I hear in some transpersonal circles to bracket out beliefs as just being a matter of sort of dry, abstract metaphysics that we don't need to bother about. Um, and, and equally, I think people's, people's actions are very um, important. There's a tendency in some of the New Age people that I... I uh, work with in my, in my church, I think, to be so concerned about the inner world that they, they're not very concerned with the, the outer external world, with, with um, society, with how things run, and with, with any practical expression of their developing spirituality. That seems to me a trap. But interestingly, the... the the um, ecological movement, I think, has become quite an important escape route from that. And a lot of New Agers who take the spiritual path very seriously have become so exercised about the real-world issue of, of threat to the environment that they, that they are moving more into, in, 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 into social and political action than <coughs> used to be the case. So, and it's, um, it's interesting, I think, that the ecological movement has been the issue that has nudged them into taking more practical action than I think used to be the case 10 or 20 years ago, and that seems to me a very healthy development. <coughs> Let me say something about my me methodology, as otherwise you may, be, you may be puzzled as to where I'm coming from and what I'm doing. Um, I... I'm interested in psychology, that's where my background is. I'm interested in, in religious traditions, I'm particularly in, in my own Christianity, but uh, I think there's equally valid work to be done on other faith traditions. Um, I hope that was implicit in what I was saying about how we, how we tackle what, what world religions in, in my church. I am a Christian. I think it's helpful to be deeply rooted in one faith tradition rather than to sort of try and talk some, some kind of religious Esperanto, sort of, uh, a, um, a, a, sort of a general religious language that doesn't really belong to any culture. I think it really is helpful to be deeply rooted in one religious tradition. I'm deeply rooted in Christianity. I know that there are other people here rooted in other religious traditions. I entirely respect that. All I say is that it's helpful in working with religion to be deeply rooted in some tradition rather than to sit so lightly on all traditions that you have no roots anywhere. So I draw on two sources. I draw on, on my faith tradition of Christianity. I draw on psychology. And my methodology is generally to keep these distinct and to look at the relationship between them. So when I'm approaching questions about human nature, 
or religion or uh, itself, then what I tend to do is to look at what psychology has to say, look at what my faith tradition has to say, and, and to draw on both, but keeping them distinct. And I think that might be different from what some people in transpersonal psychology do, though again I leave you to make up your minds about this. I think quite a lot of transpersonal psychology, I'm not against this, it's just not what I'm doing, quite a lot of people in transpersonal psychology are creating some kind of new synthesis, drawing selectively on some things in, in psychology, drawing selectively on other things in the faith traditions of the world and synthesizing those to create something new and different that's not quite psychology as we had it before, not quite the faith traditions we, as we had it before, but something new and different that synthesizes those, those elements into transpersonal psychology. You can decide whether that's a characterization of what you're involved in or not. But I, I'm, as a, though I'm not against that, it's not on the whole what I, what I do. I tend to keep my psychology as psychology. I tend to keep my faith tradition as a faith tradition and to draw on both in, in approaching the, the questions I do. Um, in dealing with the, these issues, it's, I think you have to take some stance about the kind of split, the dualism between objectivity and subjectivity that has um, uh, had such a pernicious effect on our culture. It's one of those important dualisms. There are a whole series, aren't there? Sort of uh, mind, mind and body, cognition and emotion, objective and subjective. These dualisms have have had a very pernicious effect on our, on, on our culture for some decades now. And many of us are looking for a way of escaping from these dualisms. Though one of the curious things is how difficult it is to find a way of escaping from them, even when you're quite clear that that's what you want to do. But that's, a, that's another story. This, this division between the objective and the subjective and it seem, it seems to have got much worse in the 19th century. I'm sort of skating very hastily over some complex intellectual history. But I think in the, in the 19th century, you find writers coming to distinguish much more sharply between different ways of using language. Um, a kind of uh, the way language is used scientifically, uh, referring objectively, referentially to the extent, uh, external world, and all sorts of other more subjective, evocative uses of language in poetry, in, in religion, in morality, all sorts of other things like that. Um, symbolic, subjective uses of language rather than objective, referential uses of language. And this kind of split, I think, has, uh, um, has, has had a huge impact on our intellectual world. It's basically the kind of two cultures that C.P. Snow was writing about in the, in, in the middle of the 20th century. And many of us want to find a way of healing, healing this split. And a lot of the work I do on, on, on science and religion is basically an exercise in trying to heal that split between science that at least sees itself on the objective side of that divide and religions who've often been put on the subjective side. A lot of what theology has been through over the last hundred years has been um, uh, uh, really objecting to being cast on the subjective side of that divide and wanting to argue back in one way or another, no, we're as objective as anything else. Psychology, of course, has also sometimes been cast on the subjective side of that divide, sort of merely psychological. Um, if um, and, and psychology has also been fighting back rather too hard sometimes, wanting to be rather too self-consciously scientific as a way of protesting against being cast on the, on the subjective side of that, of that divide. But I think the solution to this problem is really to reject the divide altogether. I mean, it's just not a sensible divide to have. And science, it seems to me, is not as objective as it makes out it is. 
it kind of protests too much about its objectivity. The scientific process is much more diverse, much more human, involves a lot more judgment and discernment than most scientists are prepared to allow for. And a lot of writing about scientific methodology has uh, emphasized the process of hypothesis testing and has largely ignored the process of arriving at scientific insights, which is where, the, where subjectivity comes into the scientific process. On the other hand, it seems to me that the, the, the various things that have been cast, cast on the other side um, have, have much more... Um, integrity about them than, than is usually recognized. Um, though it's important sometimes for them to recognize that themselves and to recognize that there are ways of saying things about the world that are true, uh, albeit coming to that uh, um, through processes of imagination and so on. In some circles, there's now a lot of squeamishness about concepts of reality and truth. I regret that. They do seem to me still enormously important concepts. And I think it's very important for people who are working imaginatively not to give up on the idea that there is a real world about which we can say true things, albeit in a slightly different way from how, um, from how scientists say them. Um, the poet Coleridge was also a very interesting philosopher and he, and he writes about this in a very interesting way, making the distinction between imagination and fancy. Fancy is kind of arbitrary, wishful thinking, um, sort of making out things of what you want them to be. But imagination, imagination is imaginative, but it's faithful and true. And I think a, a large part of the, uh, of the task that we face in our time is learning to have a faithful imagination, to employ our imaginations richly, not to imagine we can understand the world by just being detached, objective, and not being involved much at all, to realize how important and personal uh, is the task of understanding the world, but how that task can still be conducted in a way that is, that is, that is faithful. Um, to, to the world that we, that we find ourselves in. So that's the kind of way in which I would want to sort of uh, um, um, heal the, the split between, between the so-called objective, so-called subjective worlds that has become so important in our Western culture and which my, my teaching post in theology and science find, finds itself straddling. Um, um, and I might just acknowledge that the, that, the, that the shadow of Owen Barfield has been very much behind that, that last, last part, part of the talk. Uh, um, Barfield uh, has, uh, um, has written a brilliant book on Coleridge. I mean, Barfield is, in a sense, the modern Coleridge. And it, it was uh, a book that he'd mulled over for many years before he eventually published it. And published it with the marvellously confident title, What Coleridge Thought. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and there's another, another paper of Barfield's about language and discovery, um, and, and, which is just behind me, in which Barfield talks about people being locked in these two adjoining prison cells, sort of, uh, um, of personless objectivity and, uh, and uh, um, mere fancy, on the other hand, and suggests that the way for each of these prisoners to find an escape from their prison cells is to make contact with one another and to hold hands, and I think that's quite a powerful metaphor. Anyway, enough, enough um, of that. Let me move on to, what, on, on to some more, more substantive things. I want to say something about forgiveness, which I think is a, is a very interesting topic on the interface of theology and psychology. Of course, it's a topic which has been very important in the religious traditions for a very long time. It's now migrated in a very interesting way across into psychology, partly as a result of the beneficence of the John Templeton Foundation, who are very generous to me as well. There is now a huge forgiveness research industry, 
In fact, I think, I think it's the Templeton Foundation's greatest success story. I think they really did manage to pump prime uh, a forgiveness research industry, and it's now so, so well launched that they've completely given up funding forgiveness research because they don't think there's any need for them to do it anymore. It's just being funded by ordinary research sources. And that, is, that really is a nice success story. So we have... We have a, a significant body of thought and knowledge about forgiveness coming from both psychology and from the faith traditions. And it's interesting to kind of put them together. And one of the things we were trying to do in that book on forgiveness in context that David referred to was to, was to do um, forgiveness in a more interdisciplinary way. And even though forgiveness is being now reflected on quite deeply in both of these disciplines, there's very little cross-disciplinary work. We thought that they had a lot to learn from each other. Certainly at the practical level, the faith traditions have a lot to learn from, from psychology. At the level of pastoral work with people within faith communities who have problems of grievance and offence <coughs> that, uh, um, that could be healed by forgiveness. Um, <coughs> Um, psychology now has a lot of practical wisdom and know-how to contribute to how people can go about the business of forgiving. It's reduced it to sort of something like a cookbook, so steps that you need to go through if you're going to do forgiveness when it's difficult. Um, not everyone, I think, has to go through these steps explicitly. Some people just find their way through instinctively. But this is sort of breaking it down into kind of painting by numbers for people who are not managing to do it without that kind of aid. And I think that really is very helpful in, in practical situations and the faith traditions have a lot to be grateful to for the, the, the forgiveness ther therapy research interest at that level. But on the other hand, I think the faith traditions have a rather broader understanding of forgiveness than psychology so far has, and they could learn from the faith traditions about that. I don't think there's anything in psychology that makes it necessarily limited in its approach. It's just that it has been rather limited so far, and it could usefully be nudged towards a broader approach to forgiveness. So psychologists so far have been almost entirely preoccupied with people extending forgiveness, doing forgiveness. There's largely, they've neglected the business of receiving forgiveness, which can be an equally difficult psychological problem because to have someone forgive you can seem appallingly patronizing and there can be a great sort of uh, uh, resistance to receiving forgiveness. Um, it, it, it's a perfectly good topic for psychological research. There's no reason why psychology should neglect the receiving of forgiveness. It just has so far. Um, whereas I think, I think the faith traditions, for understandable reasons, have been much more concerned with receiving forgiveness. The, a, a lot of the, the forgiveness they're concerned with, the forgiveness that's felt to come from God, and the question is not how you do that, but how you receive it. So um, I think that's a kind of imbalance in the psychology that the faith traditions could nudge towards correcting. And there's a different sense, I, I think, about, um, about whether psychology is some, sorry, whether forgiveness is something in which you participate or whether it's an initiative you take. Most psychology sees it as an initiative. The faith traditions on the whole are more inclined to see it as something you participate in that there is an ongoing stream of forgiveness that arises at some point higher up source than yourself. And you can conceptualize that in different ways. I mean, either in, in, in the collective spirituality of humanity, in God, or, or whatever. But I think there is a sense of forgiveness arising upstream. There being a kind of process of forgiveness that's going on before you in which you can participate rather than something that you have to do in lonely isolation on your own. And I think that makes it a completely different experience. And the, um, 
the faith tradition sense of participating in forgiveness rather than initiating it is in some ways very helpful. It makes the attributions, for example, very different. And uh, all psychologists by now know, know how much different attri difference attributions make. <coughs> Um, also, I think psychology tends to see forgiveness as just an isolated act. One particular grievance, one particular need for forgiveness, you do that. Just a kind of isolated um, instance of forgiveness. Whereas I think the faith traditions are more inclined to see the capacity forgiveness as something that is an ongoing process of character development that you develop a disposition towards forgiveness, that this arises slowly and gradually as a result of personal transformation. And then individual acts of forgiveness arise out of that ongoing transformation rather than just being a one-off thing that you do in and of itself. Um, and again, that I think is, is, is a helpful different and broader perspective that the forgiveness research industry so far hasn't really taken on board. So I think there are things from, from, from um, that both psychology and the faith traditions can learn from each other about forgiveness. I think um, the faith traditions can benefit from the better practical guidance that psychology gives. Psychology can benefit from the rather broader conceptual framework that the faith traditions nudge them towards. <coughs> <clears throat> something else that, that, that psychology hasn't, hasn't really got to grips with I think is how difficult forgiveness is for some kinds of people again there's no need for psychology to be naive about this but it has largely neglected individual differences and, and you probably have to get to a certain stage of psychological development before you can do forgiveness you need a certain kind of integrative complexity. You need to be able to see black and white and hold them together in an overall picture rather than just slot rattle between the two. If you can't do that, you're not going to be able to forgive. And if you think about these things in Melanie Klein kind of terms, you need, probably need to get to at least the depressive position before you can do any, 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 any forgiveness. Only then do you have the kind of complexity of relationships to be able to, able to do that. So I think, I think um, um, uh, that's, that's something that, that, that most people involved in forgiveness need to take on board more than they have. In a way, it's, it sits more easily with the, the faith tradition's idea of forgiveness as a virtue that you slowly learn. But I think they haven't quite understood the, the kind of personality development that needs to underpin that. Um, and we also, all of us in this field, I think, need to, need to um, distinguish between acts of forgiveness of different depths or superficiality. And there are two hallmarks of deeper forgiveness. I think one is that they are costly and difficult and draw considerably on the inner resources of the individual. And the other hallmark of, of deep forgiveness is that it, uh, it contributes powerfully to the personal transformation of the person if they can manage to do forgiveness when it's difficult. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the forgiveness that goes on, I think, in everyday life and, and in, in forgiveness therapy is, is fairly superficial. But I think those of us interested in things from a sort of uh, psychology and faith point of view or transpersonal psychology point of view are going to be more interested in the deep kind of forgiveness that is personally costly and personally transforming. And we need some better way of making that kind of distinction in, in the forgiveness research. It's a kind of distinction that needs to be made about all sorts of everyday virtues. And um, hope is, is, is another one. Hope has become quite a fashionable thing in positive psychology, much popularized by Martin Seligman. Uh, and, and we have lots of, lots of questionnaires for measuring what is called hope. But actually, it seems to me that the, the, that the questionnaires I know coming out of that literature purporting to measure hope don't measure what I would call hope at all. 
Um, and the um, theological literature I read about hope makes an important conceptual distinction between hope and optimism. Optimism is what happens when things are going well and you predict that they're just going to go on going well. And, 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 and I, I, think, uh, I think that's largely what the Seligman kind of questionnaires are measuring. Um, there's nothing very profound about that. I mean, it probably does have some consequences, but there's nothing very profound about that. The interesting thing about hope, as distinct from optimism, is that you can hope even in circumstances where there may be no ground for optimism at all. People in a concentration camp with no realistic hope of, a, of, of escape or even of living can continue in some strange sense to have an attitude of hope. And there is very little psychological interest so far in that kind of hope the theological literature that I read about these things says that that's what hope really is. That's the kind of hope that's really transforming. And it would be interesting to get psychologists, I think, to do some research on hope in that sense rather than mere optimism, which is what I, I think the hopefulness research industry is largely looking at at the moment. So that's an, that's an example of where there are sort of topics like forgiveness and just briefly hope where, where um, psychology and the faith traditions both have an interest and can converge and I think there can be a fruitful dialogue between the two and they can, they can learn something from each other. Let me just very, very quickly, because I'm, I'm running out of time a bit, say, say something about, um, about some other, other areas. There are... There are um, uh, topics which are really central to the, to the faith traditions um, where, where psychology has, has an important contribution to make. And um, let, me, let me talk more specifically about my own faith tradition of um, Christianity and the kind of beliefs that, that people have there. What, what we really need, I think, in reflecting on, on Christian beliefs or doctrine is not a better conceptualization of those beliefs. There's been lots of work on that, and uh, quite good work, and I'm not really convinced that there is much more usefully to be done there. What we need is a better understanding of the personal significance of those beliefs to people. I mean... Um, why people hold the religious beliefs they do and what difference it makes to them to hold those beliefs. It's, um, it, it, it's work on the interface of beliefs on the one hand and sort of personality, personal transformation on the other. And it's that that's been very largely neglected. And I think... Um, the, uh, there are various psychological so sources to draw on there, but the work of Jung is particularly helpful. The aspect of Jung that I, I find is particularly useful here is Jung's distinction between the ego and the self. As you know, what Jung means by the ego is fairly much the same as what Freud means by its sort of center of conscious personality. But he has this separate idea of the self, the uh, whole person into which various things have been integrated and are not part of the ego, and the sort of full potential self that we can move towards, that we can become a kind of higher, complete self. And there's a very interesting axis then that gets set up between the ego and, and the self, an axis that can dysfunction in various ways. The uh, two main dysfunctions, the ego can feel so crushed and so limited that it has no sense of being able to connect with the self at all. Or the ego can become, become so grandiose and inflated that it kind of pretends that it is already the self when really it isn't, it isn't at all. Uh, and a healthy axis between the ego and, the, and self avoids those twin pitfalls of crushed ego and grandiose ego. It seems to me that an awful lot of Christian doctrine is in a way that's 
very strikingly parallel to that, steering a path between two extremes that are analogous to the crushed ego and the grandiose ego. So, for example, in Christianity, there's a belief about the second coming of Christ. And at one extreme, there's a kind of idea that that has already completely happened, that there's nothing, nothing really to look forward to, or that it's going to happen sort of in, in two years and three days' time or something like, like that. Uh, there's another view in which, in, which, in which that sort of disappears into the never-never land, so it's, it's sort of um, kept on the deck as some sort of formal player, but it is, is, is so much uh, uh, um, on, on the horizons, it has no impact on, on, on present experience at all. And... The, um, I think the mainstream Christian tradition has struggled with those alternatives and, and come up with what it calls an inaugurated eschatology, by which it means that the, that the kingdom of Christ to which Christians look forward to is partly here already, but partly still to come. And you need to hold that together. That seems to me rather interestingly analogous to the um, access between uh, the healthy access between ego and self that's avoiding either the crushed or the grandiose positions. And I could go through quite a lot of other areas of Christian doctrine and kind of illustrate how that theme p plays over and over and over again. One can also look at the roots of religious. Um, belief, the, the, the psychological roots of whether people believe in God or not. Of course there are purely rational things that are, en enter into that, but there's been a, a recently a very interesting body of research on emotional atheism, which has tried to unpack the kind of emotional reasons why people uh, uh, um, arrive at an atheist position. Atheism is enormously diverse, and we need a much better taxonomy of atheism than we, than we um, have so far. And obviously there's a huge difference between people who are just indifferent to religion and have no particular views about it, and, and militant atheists like, like Dawkins. And just in terms of personality, de personal development, I suspect that... But, Militant atheists are usually converts to atheism, as, as, as Dawkins is. I mean, Dawkins, Dawkins grew up with very conservative Christian missionary parents who have a lot to answer for, um, <laughs> and who, 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 um, 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 who taught Daw Dawkins that the Bible and evolution were incompatible. And, and Dawkins, faithful to his parents, has gone on believing that, but just in his teens switched sides and have been sort of virulently on the, on, the, on the other side ever, ever since. It seems to me there's a kind of, there is very often an emotional, psychological basis to the kind of atheism that people like Dawkins hold. We need to understand better the psychological roots and significance and implications of the kind of religious beliefs that people, people hold. That's one of the important, important tasks ahead, I think. Um, and it's, it's um, also, also helpful to bring converging perspectives on religious life and practice itself. Um, religion, it seems to me, has done great good in the world. It's also done enormous harm in the world. And it's one of the puzzling things about religion that it can do both. Uh, it seems to me just simplistic to say all religion's good, all religion's bad, that you need to be discriminating about religion that there is true and false religion, religion that is sort of, uh, that comes from a deep spiritual place and does good, and, and superficial religion that, uh, come, uh, uh, um, that is much more likely to do harm. And it's helpful to understand this in terms of, 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 of the interplay between personal issues and form, forms of religious faith. And there's a danger for all of us involved in faith communities. 
to allow our religious faith to be distorted by our personal needs and preoccupations so that the religious faith just becomes a kind of mirror image of those and keeps us entrenched in the kind of, uh, in the kind of psychological limitations we have. So there's a tendency, it seems to me, from my pastoral experience, I don't think this has been properly investigated, there's a, there's a tendency for people who are prone to have guilt feelings to believe in a kind of judgmental God who keeps them trapped in their guilt feelings. And, and then religion gets distorted and limited and just becomes part of a sort of psychologically driven, self-maintaining loop. It seems to me that religion is not doing any good for the person concerned or for, or, or, or for their uh, uh, um, interaction with the world. But I think there's a possibility for things to go the other way and, and for um, someone's faith to, to, to be a force that, um, that liberates them from their psychological limitations and preoccupations. So someone who is who is rather prone to guilt feelings, can hear the message of forgiveness that is central in the faith traditions, can be liberated by that, so that a more balanced and and true faith actually works to assist them in the journey of personal transformation, rather than just keeping them entrenched in in the limited psychological position they started for and drawing their faith into the part of that vicious circle. And for those of us interested in the interface between psychology and religion, I think that is in the end perhaps one of the most important things, to use a psychological perspective to elucidate more clearly what the difference is essentially between true and false forms of faith. And there I think I'd like to finish. Yes, I'm very happy to do that. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, and Marcel has written a very interesting essay about this, and, and, and he does completely understand this distinction between, between hope and optimism that I'm talking about. Yes, I mean, he's a good source of that. So, I mean, I, 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 I talked about this distinction being in the, in the theological literature, but it is also in that existentialist philosophy literature as well. Yeah, you're completely right. Clive. True religion is, uh, Anthony has, has taken half the question mm. uh, from it. <clears throat> The distinction, I, I, I share your reservations about Marty, Marty Seligman. Mm. I am much more interested in hope. Whereas Anthony was thinking of, of in that area, I'm, well, I always go back to Victor Frankl and notions of logotherapy and have his, mm. his mm. experience mm. in Dakar, mm. was it? Mm. And my question would be in that situation in which all source of hope is ostensibly gone, for yes. example, to, yes. to, to the external yes. observer. Yes. What is your feel, what is your take on the subjective experience of that hope which persists nonetheless? What do you feel are its objects? What do you think are, are, the, are the entities, on, the, the hooks on which it hangs? Yes. Do you know? Is that... Yes. I think I think I understand. I think it, I, I think it's something that psychologically takes imagination. I think it's interesting that Viktor Frankl made ex- very explicit use of imagination in keeping his hope alive. Sort of um, imagining how he could lecture about the uh, about his concentration camp experiences, 
I think that, uh, that enabled him to kind of reconfigure the experiences he was going through. And I, su- I suspect that um, hope in adverse circumstances usually depends on some deep commitment of imagination. I think that's the best I can do with that. Les. I was very interested in the way you talked about um, the, the, uh, the border mm. between your approach and what you described as maybe producing a synthesis mm. of psychology mm. and religion. And um, I... I think that in some ways that, that borderline that you're talking about mm. maybe does demarcate mm. Mm. transversal psychology mm. from the psychology of religion. Mm. I think mm. it's quite a useful point to, yes. to bear in mind. Yes. But on the other hand, I would challenge you a little, and really it's not a question as much as asking you to, mm. to elaborate a little bit more. I would say that, I mean, you also talk of Jung a great deal. I would say yes. Jung par excellence mm. is an example of someone who is did draw from mm. the two disciplines mm. Mm. and produce something yes. new for yes. which we, in many yeah. ways, are very thankful. Yes. And, and if I think about the religion that I'm most interested in looking at, my own religion, like yes. so, um, areas of language, the great hermeneutical aspect of, mm. of, of Judaism, mm. but also it comes mm. from mm. ideas of, of different levels of connection with the divine. Yes. And, and yes. I've mentioned many others. They, yes. they, they yes. are really there yes. as the interface yes. between yes. religion and psychology. Yes. And, and the challenge to look at the synthesis, I think, is a very real and very good <coughs> Yes. Yes. Um, um, it's, a good, it's a good point. I'm happy to respond and to elaborate a little bit more. I mean, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not myself most interested in psychology of religion. Um, that seems to be an exercise in which, in which psychology is doing things entirely on its own terms, really, and, the, and, though, uh, and though there is a clear distinction between psychology and religion, it's a very one-sided <laughs> kind of relationship. Um, I'm, all, 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 and, uh, I, I'm also getting less interested in sort of practical pastoral psychology where the church sort of has its own agenda and uses psychology for, for its own ends. In both of those cases, I think there's a very unequal kind of relationship between the two. And that leaves us, I think, with two possibilities. One is, is the one that I have mainly used um, in the past and in this talk of t- keeping psychology and religion distinct. Um, as roughly equal partners, drawing on, on both of them in slightly different ways, but drawing on them both, keeping them distinct, t- um, treating them each with respect, and, and the other approach to synthesis. I'm not, I, I, I want to emphasize I'm not against the synthesis approach. I was just making the distinction between that and what I normally do, so uh, to avoid misunderstanding. And there have been some great synthesizers. And I think Jung is very largely a synthesizer in a different kind of way. Teilhard de Chardin, I think, think is a brilliant synthesizer of, of a kind of evolutionary thinking and, and spirituality. So um, I'm, I'm interested in the synthesizers. It's just not primarily what I do myself. Lots of hands. Don't know where to go. Yes, at the back. Yes. Um, there is, um, there's another sort of I don't know. Um, you know, when you were talking, you talked about um, faith and hope mm. and doing research on faith and hope. Yes. Which I can certainly see as a very eminently Christian agenda mm. for mm. psychology. Mm. But from a Buddhist perspective, I wouldn't see those two concepts as particularly central. Yes. So when you talk about it and sort of slide easily between um, talking about Christianity and talking about the faith collectively, mm. Mm. I feel included in something that I don't feel personally identified with. Yes, yes. So there, there's different sorts of merging going on. Um, I hear, I hear that point, and 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 I, I. Um, 
don't want to go down the road of, of just saying all faith traditions are really the same. Yeah. I, think, I, I think there are important distinctions between them. I want to treat others with respect to learn from them, but, uh, but as I said, to remain ro- rooted in my own tradition. Very happy for other people to remain rooted in theirs. Okay. Mm. Yeah, yes. A, a, a wonderful exposition. Mm. I was interested in your point about um, you advocated that people should follow one tradition mm. faith, rather than mm. um, exploring mm. aspects of separate. I'd be interested to know um, if you're thinking about that, especially as I know that within the context of people in the transpersonal section, there are different perspectives. Yes, yes. Oh, I perhaps, um, I perhaps express myself too firmly. I, I mean, I, I'm in no position to say should. I mean, I, 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 I just think you, that you can get more, more deeply and richly into a tradition if you have a commitment to it. But, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure for, for, for some people it can, be, it can be fruitful to be a bit more gadfly. But, I mean, I, I, um, I think I'm really just saying that I, I find it very fruitful to get deeply into one tradition in the way that requires commitment. Yeah. There were some hands over here. Yes, yes. Mm. Uh, I, uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, I wanted to, to say I really appreciated your distinction of, um, of the vis-a-vis Martin Seligman and positive psychology mm. as an American who goes to some of these meetings mm. in the United States. And, uh, that a lot of, as a transpersonalist, I often find the, the way in which terms are operationalized in mm. uh, positive psychology is a bit thin. Mm. You know, they, mm. they seem thin, superficial, yes. rather yes. than going into the, the meet, yes. more needy character of, of spiritual experience or religious experience. Yes. And I have another comment, but if mm. you want to respond to that, please. Um, I, just, I just want, want, want to say I completely agree. I really welcome the fact that psychology is getting empirical about these things, but I think what the faith traditions have to offer is some richer conceptualization. That's right. And it, I could go on, but the yeah. positive psychology, it sort of takes the... Um, it, it takes religion, it, it, it's, it superficializes. Yes. Religion, it I, makes me a little crazy. Yeah, actually. yeah. But yep, I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> you had another point there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the other thing I, I want to just mention that's so that one way to synthesize the psychological and mm. spiritual, mm. Um, that I see a good uh, deal of, um, is um, looking at psychospiritual development. Yes. The interrelatedness of development that goes between um, behaviors, uh, actions, beliefs, and experience. That mm. if, as development perce- moves mm. forward and mm. backwards mm. Uh, and integrates earlier parts of one's life, there's, a, a, I think, a great deal of interplay between these. And there are a number of theorists who have mm. looked at that mm. um, in, I think, a very fruitful way. Yes. Um, I don't have a lot to add to that, really. I'm, 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 I mean, I agree that that is is, is fruitful. So yeah. that's one way. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think it is. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, my, um, first, uh, thank you for your Mm. Would you have partly answered that? Mm. So really, my, my, my naive question is really more about the challenges mm. facing uh, not just you yourself, but also mm. we as a collective community here. Yeah. Mm. But the kind of challenges are uh, for people like yourself who firmly believe with respect of one mm. faith. Mm. And, well, how is it that, uh, who, uh, that uh, your faith, whether Christianity or whatever, to claim the universal attitude which is the, the quality or transpersonal and the truth or whatever. And, and, and how is it that one could or we could um, uh, create a kind of dialogue, the, the manifest dialogue that we yes. talk about? And yes. uh, how is it that uh, we, 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 we call for the kind of inclusions that now the society is demanding? Yes, yes. These are, th- these are very important and difficult issues and... and uh, as we move into a global community increasingly, then it's, uh, it's a, 
I think is a cause of anguish for anyone involved in religion, that religion has become one of the major sources of division in the world, and, and it, it, it is just a great danger to the whole of humanity. We have, we have to find a way of dealing with this problem. And uh, how do we do that? Well, obviously, obviously um, people involved in any faith tradition need to have, a, have humility about it and respect for others. It also helps, I think, to have some deep understanding of your own faith tradition. A lot of, a lot of the threats to the security of humanity that come out of, out of religion arise from superficial misunderstandings of the faith tradition. Right. And, uh, and I think no, no serious Muslim thinks that uh, um, Muslim suicide bombers have understood, understood the Quran correctly. And if they just studied their own faith tradition a bit more deeply, then they would probably be implementing it in different ways. But we also need to, need to find, find ways in which we can talk to each other fruitfully. Um, and you know, I, I work professionally on the dialogue between theology and science. And I think, uh, I think there is, can be uh, um, a dialogue with science that all faith traditions can enter into. And I think that may be, that may be one quite good place for the faith traditions to, to talk to each other, actually. I mean... Um, it's it's the uh, major Darwin anniversary next year. I hope there will be some some sort of sharing of the different faith traditions about the impact that Darwin has made on each of them, how they've received Darwinism. I think that's an, in a way quite sort of perhaps slightly academic, but um, safe, neutral, and a helpful place for a conversation to begin. No, it's not an adequate answer, but I mean it's a very important topic. of scholarship, but at the same time, your own commitment to your teaching and your practice. I was thinking listening to Fraser, who were a judge in the lecture and say, would I like this man to supervise my doctorate? All of your students, your doctoral students, are enormously blessed to work with you and to be able to show And I, I love the way, it was almost like another thought was going through my mind. This is like pearls, this is like jewels. One after another, all the points that you were raising, the way in which you um, raised them with us. And I thought, and this would last a while, I had many other thoughts, but I don't have time to put one before. But what a joy it is to have people like you working in this area. What a joy to bring this kind of thing, not only to the attention of the section, but to the attention of a much, much broader public and the attention of the academic community. Because in a, in a sense, you're also reflecting the traditions of scholarship at Cambridge, the traditions of divinity at Cambridge, the broadness, the breadth of understanding and approach. I should say, in concluding, that Fraser has been a great friend of this section because he was one of the 20 fellows when we were establishing the section amongst the many hurdles we had to jump. 20 fellows of the, of the society to agree that this that the session should be founded. And Fraser was one of the first that I approached on this and immediately said yes. And I wonder, there may be ways we can explore drawing the section in some sense closer to the work that you were doing in Cambridge. And we can see all sorts of perhaps fertile ways to, to, to connect. So this is something that, that we can explore. And also, anybody else in the session has ideas as to how this might be. Well, Fraser, it's been a joy and a pleasure and a delight. I wish you could stay with us because there will be so many other questions. Maybe you can say as long as coffee can. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 so there will be opportunities there to use further. Fraser, many, many, many.